Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so as yesterday, I'm going to post a link in the chat um, to allow people to, to follow along uh, with what I'm writing while also seeing previous slides. Um, and uh, in the same way as, as yesterday, um, uh, I'd just like to request that sort of uh, maybe 10 minutes or, or, or five minutes into the talk, somebody could, if somebody could just copy and paste that and post it in the chat again in, for, for people who arrive, uh, who arrive later. Uh, thank you. Um, and yes, uh, so, so yesterday I, I made some, some dire warnings about the possibility that if you click this link, other people might be able to tell that you are viewing it. Uh, that didn't seem to happen yesterday, but I do not understand Google systems. So for all I know, if you, if you click, this, click this link and you have a Google account, other people can, uh, can see who you are. I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, great. So yesterday we saw um, sort of uh, the context of what I want to talk about. Um, so a, a classic result of Birch and... Um, uh, one formulation of, of the underlying method um, in terms of wanting to understand the, the measure of, of level sets of an exponential sum, um, and that being enough on its own to give you a, a, what to me is a surprising amount of arithmetic information. Um, and uh, today, uh, so here, here is that result again. Um, and uh, I mentioned that in the in a, in a uh, uh, for a similar problem involving forms with real coefficients, um, and in the in the quadratic case, um, there is a um, uh, an improvement on this number of variables that you require for Birch's result. In precisely the case which seems to be most difficult um, for for Birch's result itself. Um, and we didn't quite get to the point of, of, of understanding uh, why, it's, why it's possible to get this improvement. Um, uh, but uh, we saw some sort of first, first steps uh, towards that in terms of uh, a certain point of view on the proof of this theorem. Okay. Um, and, uh, and we defined this notation. Um, which I'm going to continue to use uh, without much further comment. That we have a vector of uh, a vector of uh, of of, linear, of homogeneous forms, They're linearly independent, so, so linearly independent in the vector space of uh, of polynomials in in n variables, for example, with coefficients in q or r. Or, of course, it doesn't make a difference. Um, uh, they all have the same degree d. Um, so that's uh, um, historically, th this was considered to be uh, sort of important, like it, it, it was a, a major adv advance when, when uh, Browning and Heath Brown found out how to do this kind of thing for, for systems of forms with different degrees um, in, a, in an efficient way. I mean, there's work of Schmidt, for example, which did it uh, previously, but with many more variables. Um, and uh, we have this, this geometric condition, which may, may pop up again. Um, I'm not sure whether it comes up again in this talk or not, but uh, it may come up again, at least next time. Um, and this is just some kind of niceness condition. All right. Um, so, uh, so here we go. So this is where we where we left it last time. Last time, uh, what, what I did um, was really introduce this lemma um, and sketch its proof. Um, uh, what color do I feel like? Maybe yellow. Um, okay. So yes, last time last time what we did is introduce uh, this formulation of of Birch's method um, and sketch a, a proof of this lemma. A. Mm. Reducing the proof of Birch's theorem to just understanding the measure of these uh, uh, of, of these sets where the exponential sum is large, um, which uh, pedantically I should be calling super level sets, um, but it's been pointed out to me uh, many times that this is too pedantic, um, and that it's it's really perfectly fine to say that this is some kind of level set. Um, okay, 
Um, and uh, so what I want to do at the start, so this talk is going to be a bit more informal uh, than the last one. Um, it's going to be a bit more about giving a sort of overview um, of, of some, uh, some ideas that we're going to explore in more depth um, over the remaining two talks. Um, and uh, so the, the, the big picture that I want to introduce um, is breaking, um, breaking Birchley's entire argument, so the, the, the proof of Birchley's original theorem, still not talking about an improvement yet, um, into these three parts. Um, which I think I referred to as four parts in, in the last talk. I suppose the last one has three sub parts, so that was probably why I, I forget. Um, uh, anyway, breaking up Berkeley's argument into these three parts. So there's a lot of notation going on here. Um, and uh, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this reasonably slowly. Um, but as I say, this talk is this talk is what is sort of the less rigorous one of the series anyway, um, and we're going to come back and uh, and dig into this properly next time. Um, okay, so as before, we have this exponential sum, uh, which I like to write. Um, so I like to write this exponential sum. Uh, as a function of a polynomial with real coefficients instead of as a function of a real vector alpha. Um, but the point is uh, that this alpha dot f is uh, sum from i equals one up to capital R of alpha i f i. So this is a polynomial in n variables with real coefficients. And this exponential sum uh, is the sum of e to the two pi i um, uh, alpha dot f. Um, so this e for e to the 2 pi i notation, which is so standard, I don't think I said out loud that this is what it meant last time, but it was written on the slides. Okay. Um, and this is summed over integer values of the variables uh, in the polynomial of size up to capital P. And what we want to do um, is we want to detect the values of those variables for, for which this exponent, 2 pi alpha dot f, is, is, is uh, uh, uniformly zero in alpha. Um, that is, for the, the, we want to detect the values of x um, for which this system of polynomials f is zero. Um, and uh, so the, the idea of Berkeley's argument is to handle uh, is to bound this exponential sum, so to, to show that it's uh, small um, in most places in the following way. Um, so first we perform what's called vial difference. Um, and um, the idea here, so this, this, this I hope is, is an argument that we'll uh, you know, see, see elsewhere this week. Um, so I'm not going to, to go, we're, we're going to use this as something of a black box. Um, uh, but the result of this, this black box argument um, is that if the exponential sum is large, um, then a certain counting function has to be large. So there's, there's to me, there's a satisfying circularity here, uh, the good kind of circularity. We started with a counting problem. Um, trying to count uh, zeros of this system of forms f. Um, so there are there's some things, some pieces of notation which are no longer defined on, on this slide, uh, like what this counting function is, but uh, they're either defined on the slide before or the slide after if you're, uh, if you're following along online. Um, okay. Um, uh, so I'm currently uh, sitting on slide three in today's slides. Okay, um, so the idea here um, is that if the exponent, we started with it with a counting problem, trying to count zeros of the system of forms, we passed by lemma A from that counting problem to a problem of, of, of studying when this exponential sum is large. Um, and uh, now we pass back to a different counting problem. If the exponential sum is large, then another counting function has to be large. So what is what is this thing on the right hand on the on the left hand side here? Um, 
So it's defined in this bullet point up here. Um, it is, uh, so it's a set of solutions to some Diophantine inequalities. Um, in fact, to a, to a very nice set of Diophantine inequalities because they're, they're multilinear. Um, and uh, yes, I, actually one, one, uh, one argument, one sort of way to motivate doing, doing this vial differencing argument that gives you this lemma at all is that it, 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 you end up with, with some kind of multilinear problem, um, which is easier to solve than, the, uh, than the, the sort of genuine polynomial that you started with. Um, okay, so what exactly, uh, what kind of problem do we have here? Um, so this is this is somehow uh, the heart of the heart of Berkeley's method, um, and uh, the underlying ideas were really introduced, I think, by by Davenport in his paper on uh, cubic forms in uh, seventeen, I think, variables, or oh, perhaps it was thirty two. The Davenport paper, I forget. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, so the idea, in any case is starting with a form of degree D with perhaps real coefficients. So think of capital F as being perhaps this form alpha dot F. Um, we define a vector of multilinear forms. Um, so this vector M is an N vector. Uh, each entry in that N vector is a polynomial. Um, it's a polynomial in uh, D minus one times N variables, so a rather large number of variables. Um, and uh, these variables are organized into D minus one vectors of N variables each. Um, and symmetric here means that if we were to permute these D minus one vectors, um, then we would get the same system of polynomials again. Um, so this, this system of polynomials is invariant under permutations of these D minus one vectors. Um, okay. Uh, and in fact, the one way to define what, 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 what this system M is, is it's the unique vector of N symmetric multilinear forms, uh, symmetric in the sense that I just described that you can rearrange these vectors without changing the polynomials, um, with this property here. So if I plug D minus one copies of the same vector in, um, so I sort of restrict to the diagonal, if you like, uh, then what I should get is, is basically just the gradient of the degree D form that I started with. Um, so this, this uh, here is supposed to mean, um, um, this is the vector DF, by dx1 up to df by dxm. Okay, so this being a, a polynomial um, at this stage. Uh, so here um, we have this polynomial capital F in n vectors in an n vector of variables little x, um, and we and its gradient is is this this thing here. Um, so this M is supposed to be a kind of multilinear version of the gradient. So it's, a, it's, a, it's the natural system of multilinear forms to associate to the gradient um, of, of, this, of this form. Um, so, so words like polar form appear in this context sometimes. Um, okay. And what are we doing with that? Well, we're going to count the number of integer values of these, uh, of these uh, D minus one vectors of variables, um, uh, such that um, uh, this value of th this vector of multilinear forms um, is close to an integer vector. Uh, so this, this polynomial capital F here is allowed to have real coefficients. So even if we plug in integer values for the variables, um, that doesn't uh, particularly tell us anything about this real vector uh, M. Um, and uh, um, um, it doesn't particularly tell us anything about this real vector M. 
Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to count the integer values of these ve vectors x1 up to x d minus one, uh, such that uh, those, those vectors take integer values up to p to the theta, so up to some size, theta is, is just some parameter, so this just means sort of up to some size. Um, so this vector of real, real numbers now um, is within this small distance of an integer vector. Um, so this is some kind of Diophantine approximation looking problem. Um, and this, this uh, if, if you haven't seen it before, this looks completely unnatural. Um, and, uh, you know, in a way, perhaps, perhaps it is. Um, I mean, this, this comes out of the, of the vial differencing machine. Um, the, the analog in, in the case of, say, diagonal forms looks a, looks a lot more natural. Um, uh, one, one would perhaps like to do something different and more efficient here, um, but this, this, this really has uh, some startling advantages. Um, and, you know, one of those advantages is exactly that this Diophantine approximation problem involves a multi-system of multilinear forms and linear problems are easy. Um, okay, so uh, what is the result here? Um, so the result that we get by vial differencing, um, uh, so we can choose any value for this parameter theta uh, between zero and one. Um, and then for that, for, for, for that value of theta that we've chosen, um, we, we get that if the exponential sum is large, so I've divided here by the trivial bound for the exponential sum and by the trivial bound for this counting function. Um, uh, if the exponential sum is large, uh, then this counting function is large. Um, and the relationship between the two is here, I divided by a trivial bound, just the number of uh, vectors of integer variables of this size. Here I've divided by a trivial bound, just the number of terms being summed over in the sum. Um, and there's a two to the d minus first power here. Um, and that represents some kind of loss, as we'll see. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a lot to take in. Um, and for, for anyone who hasn't seen this before, um, you know, I, I, I expect it'll, it'll be necessary to sort of view this as a bit of a black box and to flip back and forwards in the slides. Um, and I hope that the other talks in, 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 this, uh, in this summer school will, will give you uh, a bit more of an ability to guess at what might be going on here. Um, okay. Um, the idea in any case is uh, that once, we, once we've applied this, uh, all we need to do um, is show that uh, the measure of the set of alpha, such that this counting function is large, uh, is not too big. Um, so here in this uh, in this counting function, um, for the for this form capital F, we plugged in the form alpha dot f, which is the right kind of thing. It's a, it's a degree d form in um, with real coefficients in n variables. So the right type of object to set there. Um, so this left hand side in particular has some dependence on alpha. Um, and if alpha had, for example, if alpha was, for example, an integer vector, and since f has integer coefficients, this here would be a form with integer coefficients. Um, this vector here um, would have uh, would have integer coefficients, um, uh, or perhaps depending on my normalization, perhaps it would be um, uh, small, small rational coefficients, uh, rational coefficients, a small denominator, it doesn't matter. Um, the point is that if, if um, alpha was an integer vector, then this would be something like an integer vector. And so it would be trivial that it was, that it was close to an integer vector. Um, but that's uh, not, so that's kind of an extreme case. We want to think of alpha as being uh, in the unit hypercube. Um, so this sort of worst case scenario when this counting function is very large is going to happen only when alpha is at the corners of this hypercube, um, which that's, that's being uh, very much on the major arcs. Okay. Um, and what we want to do is kind of say that uh, the only way this counting function can be large 
is when alpha is close to a, to a rational vector of small denominator. Um, so uh, thank you for copy and pasting the slides. Um, so uh, Okay, um, let's take a look at what that means. So this is, uh, this is Berkeley's sort of application of this vial differencing technique um, to really show what we want, to show that this exponential sum can be large only on a set of small measure. Um, okay, uh, and this involves the um, sets of major arcs, um, which, uh, so I'll flip to slide uh, four now, um, uh, which, yes, so the definition of the major arcs appears again at the, at the top of slide four. Um, uh, so what goes on here um, is uh, rather interesting. So what we have here is we have a hypothesis, not simply that this, uh, counting function is large, um, but that it is not contained in a certain set of bad points. So what we want to do here is we want to find a solution to these multilinear inequalities here, which in some sense is good, is a good solution, um, or a good d minus one tuple of integer vectors. Um, and if we can do that, um, then we'll be able to show that alpha lies on some major arcs. Um, and what major arcs depends on this, this parameter theta. Um, so how does, this, how does this end up giving us, how does this technical looking result end up giving us something useful? Um, well, this set of bad points is small. Um, so part three of this lemma uh, says that, so don't worry yet about what this set of bad points is. Um, it, just think of it as uh, some mysterious bad set. Um, we know that that bad set is not too big. So I've, I've again, um, so the, this, this, set, of, this set N, uh, this set of solutions to these multilinear inequalities, um, this is a set of integer uh, of d minus one tuples of integer n vectors of size up to p to the theta. So the, uh, and this set of bad points, it's also going to be a set of uh, integer d minus one tuples of size up to p to the theta. Um, and so the trivial bound, just the number of integer d minus one tuples of size up to p to the theta is about this big, p to the d minus one n theta. Um, and so again, I've, I've just normalized by dividing by a trivial bound here. Um, so what this part three says is that the set of bad points is smaller than, than, than the trivial bound. It's, it's non-trivially small. Um, and so by putting one and three together, we will be able to show that this set, this set of solutions to these Diophantine inequalities, um, if it's large, if there are many solutions, there must be at least one good solution. That is at least one solution that is not contained in this bad set. Um, and that will imply that alpha lives on some major arcs. That is to say that alpha is close to a rational vector of small common denominator. Um, okay, so there's a lot going on here. Um, and the, the remaining part, so this is not quite the order in which Bert presents things, but I've sort of wanted to lay his argument out before you all in one place. Um, uh, so the final part um, is that the measure of this set of major arcs is not too big. Um, so that, that fine, so we can put, that will allow us to put all three of these results together. Uh, in fact, to prove Birch's theorem that, that I stated before. Um, so, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not, people are welcome to, to ask me questions about that later, um, or indeed now, um, but I'm just, otherwise I will, I will just sort of give a, 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 a gesture in the direction of how that works. Um, so, uh, first we assume that the exponential sum is large. We assume that this exponential sum in fact is large enough 
to figure in this hypothesis here. Um, so here we have this super level set and we assume that alpha is an element of this super level set here. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I wouldn't worry so much about this greater than greater than, it's just bigger than some constant times this. Um, okay. Uh, so we assume first that alpha is counted by this set here. Um, and then what, what this, and then we need to choose theta. So theta, uh, this second lemma is true for all theta, it's a parameter that we have to choose. Um, and what we should do, it turns out, is we should choose theta so that theta, the theta is just a little bit bigger than this thing here. Um, and I've used colors to try to kind of hint at where this comes from. Um, so here in this third part, our set of bad points um, was smaller than the trivial bound um, by, by this factor here. And here in lemma B, we have this two to the D minus first power. Uh, which, I, which I told you was some kind of loss. Um, uh, and it turns out that we should choose P to the theta to look like this. There's a K in the, in the exponent so that uh, theta somehow scales with how large we're asking our, our exponential sum to be. And there's also a quotient of this green number and, and, and this magenta number. Um, and it turns out that if one, if, if one chooses uh, theta, so that P to the theta is a little bigger than this, um, then the fact that the exponential sum is large, the fact that it's counted in our super level set here, uh, together with our vial differencing lemma B, um, and our bound on the set of bad points, uh, lemma, lemma C part three, um, will all go together uh, to ensure that this thing is true. Um, so that the, uh, the number of solutions to these multilinear inequalities is so large that the, these solutions can't all be bad. At least one of them is not contained in this bad set Ensing. Um, and I haven't told you yet anything about Ensing. I've just said that it's some kind of set of bad things. Uh, that's, that's going to be um, the next part of the talk is what this is about. Um, I mean, the definition is on the board, but I really haven't explained what it is. Um, Okay, so making these choices here uh, is enough to verify the hypothesis of, of, of lemma C part one. Um, and the conclusion of lemma C part one, that alpha belongs to this set of major arcs, um, then turns into this thing here, that alpha belongs to uh, this set of major arcs that's indicated um, down here, so I'm on slide four. Um, and uh, then lemma C part two tells us, and I haven't, uh, so I haven't said any, I haven't really said anything about how this is this is proved um, beyond the, that we need like a, a, a good solution to these Diophantine inequalities. Um, uh, but I will say that that lemma C part two is is actually not hard. Um, so what lemma C part two really one can prove just from the definition of the major arcs. Um, and thinking about the measure of all of these little boxes here. Um, so lemma C part two uh, takes this conclusion here um, and tells us, well, that means that alpha lies in a set with measure at most this much. Um, and uh, so this is the kind of thing that we wanted. We wanted to show that if, if the exponential sum S is large, then alpha lies in a fixed set of small measure. Um, and if we inspect the, the hypothesis of lemma A, um, we find that the bound we needed, uh, P to the CK minus DR for some little C, which is less than one, um, we find that uh, this thing being true, C being less than one, uh, is exactly um, is exactly n minus r is greater than or equal to uh, r r plus one d minus one two to the d minus one oops uh, 
in there. D minus one, two to the D minus one. Um, so this will be exactly the condition for, for little c to be less than one. And this is the hypothesis that appeared in Birch's, Birch's theorem. Um, so something that I have been uh, alighting in my global explanation um, uh, is that Birch's theorem have this, this geometric niceness condition that the system of forms should be non-singular. Um, and that appears in part three of this Lenus C. So that's where, that's where that got used. Um, uh, that is in bounding the set of the set of bad uh, bad tuples. Um, okay. Right. Um, so as I say that, there's a lot going on there, um, and uh, will be a, and what I want to do it now is sort of explore this in a little bit more depth. Um, and in particular, try to try to get some sense of how we might do better. So how we might improve this condition here and get by with a smaller number of variables. Um, okay. So on to slide five then. Um, and most of what, what was on previous slides is, is still visible, even if you're even if you're on Zoom. Um, uh, so here we have a, a lot of notation um, all collected together. Here we have again our, our lemma A and lemma B. Um, and uh, so what I want to talk about is, is first uh, and relatively briefly um, is how one might improve these two lemmas here. Um, so I, th I think this way of breaking up Birch's argument kind of makes sense because if you ask for an improvement in each step, um, it, it sort of comes out as a sensible thing that people have done in the real world. Um, uh, so improving lemma A, I would say, um, basically means we want to use more than just information about uh, the measure of the sets on which this sum is large. Um, so what does that mean? It means that we want to take adva advantage of some uh, additional cancellation in the exponential sum. Um, so our, our minor arc bound is going to look, a minor arc term is going to look like this, the integral of the exponential sum over the minor arcs. Um, and, uh, you know, somehow lemma A um, uh, basically amounts to let's put absolute value here and, and estimate this. Um, uh, that, that's kind of, be, being able to estimate this with, with an absolute value here is kind of morally equivalent to satisfying the, um, being able to give a satisfactory estimate, I should say, for this, um, with an absolute value here is kind of morally equivalent to satisfying the hypothesis of, of, of lemma A. Um, uh, so to improve on lemma A, what we need to do um, is get rid of these absolute values and get a better bound for this integral without absolute values than we have uh, with absolute values. Um, and uh, this, this, is, this is essentially, uh, you know, this, this, this is going to wind up being much the same thing as a, as a so-called Klusterman refinement or the Klusterman method, um, or, or averaging over, over arcs or averaging over denominators, um, various, various different terms for various different uh, arguments and parts of arguments one could use here. Um, and that's, that's very much a, a difficult and interesting thing to try to do. Um, uh, but it's notably difficult in, in, in higher dimensions. So when capital R is large, the, the, you get, getting a better bound for this than you can than you have with absolute values, it seems to be hard. Um, uh, so lemma B, um, well, I, I mentioned that this two to the D minus one is some kind of loss. It appears as a factor in the number of variables we need. Um, and one can, in, in some sense, do better here. So in, in some sense, one can, one can get something uh, smaller there. Um, so, uh, for example, the work of, of Browning and Prendeville um, does, a, does a, a van der Korpert differencing argument, um, which uh, in sort of, at least morally, it's a bit like having something smaller here, um, uh, uh, perhaps Perhaps one of the authors is watching and wants to criticize that characterization of their work, but um, 
uh, it's it's something like being able to reduce that or being able to get a better bound than this in some ranges. Um, okay. The idea is to do something uh, sort of a more subtle and vile difference. All right. Uh, so on to slide six. Um, so that's that's what would happen if we wanted to improve lemmas A or B. Um, so if we wanted to get an improvement in Birchley's theorem by modifying lemma A or lemma B um, to somehow somehow do better. Um, uh, how about lemma C? So that seems to be the uh, the, the remaining target. Um, uh, well. Uh, my claim is that the natural thing to do, or, or at least the thing that, that, that people have done, uh, is to change the definition of this bad set here. Um, uh, so to change the definition of the bad set um, in such a way uh, that you can get a better ratio um, of, of these three quantities. Um, so that means uh, reducing this blue number or increasing this, this magenta number. Um, okay. Um, and one way that one might seek to do that um, is by changing this uh, sort of uh, dark pink number up here, um, because that governs how large your, your major arcs are, um, which plays a key role in, in their measure. Um, okay. So you might want to improve any of these three parts to do better. Um, and indeed, this, this has been done. Um, so I think uh, the, in some ways, the, uh, the, the, the purest example of, 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 a, of a result which really sets out to do exactly this um, is the work of, of Dietman and, and Schindler. Um, uh, so I'm going to uh, sort of explore um, explore this um, uh, in a minute. Um, but before that, uh, let's take a look at the proof of this lemma C in order to see how we might go about trying to improve it. Okay. So here is a here is a sketch of of. Uh, part of the proof of this lemma C. Um, and this is where the, uh, the definition of, of this n sing is going to become relevant for the, for the first time, and we're going to have to think about what this actually is. Um, so what we're going to do um, to prove part one of this, which says that if this counting function is large, and alpha lives on the major arcs. And remember this counting function being large is directly related to the exponential sum being large. Um, uh, and I've, um, so I've uh, slightly restated this um, to show it in the, in the form that we actually, uh, actually use. Um, so I've said if this counting function is bigger than the number of bad tuples, although what we really want is that there, there's a, a solution uh, an element of this set here, which is not an element of this set here, not a bad tuple. Uh, okay, so let's look at the proof of this part one here. Uh, so what one does um, is one takes a, a, a d minus one tuple from this set here. Um, so that is a solution to these multilinear inequalities up here. Um, uh, a d minus one tuple of, of integer uh, n vectors, all of size at most p to the theta, such that this, this vector of, of, of multilinear forms whose definition has, has dropped off the screen. Um, so uh, this vector of multilinear forms um, was basically defined by uh, the property that if you plug the same vector in uh, d minus one times, um, then what you get is some kind of normalized version of the of the gradient of, of the form that you're plugging in. Um, okay. Um, 
and uh, let's see where I'm at on slide seven. Um, um, okay, so what we do um, is we take uh, a solution to these these Darfanton inequalities, um, uh, which is not bad. And bad, we now learn, um, means that this, this integer d minus one tuple of n vectors of size up to p to the theta, um, uh, it should, it, it bad means that there's an integer vector such that a, an integer r vector a, um, uh, and here, what I should have written is um, exists a not equal to zero. I carelessly omitted the not equal to zero. Um, so there exists a non-zero integer vector, integer r vector a, um, such that m of a dot f evaluated at this same tuple uh, vanishes every one of the n elements is zero. Um, uh, so this, this set of bad tuples, its definition doesn't depend in any way on alpha. Um, the, the sort of role of alpha is played here by an integer, an integer vector, a non-zero integer vector a, um, which, which could be anything, um, and that gets plugged in here um, in a dot f. Um, so in particular, because a is integral and f has integral coefficients, this form up here has integer coefficients. Um, okay, uh, and so it's it's kind of a reasonable thing for us to ask for this to be zero because it's a vector of integers. Um, this 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 is something that really might happen. Um, okay. Uh, so what we want is we want to we want to find a d minus one tuple which satisfies these multilinear inequalities, but there does not exist an integer r vector a with this property here. Um, okay. And what the way we use this is we associate to our d minus one tuple, x one up to d minus one, x d minus one, we associate a matrix. Um, and that matrix is, uh, it's the matrix of this linear map. Um, it's the matrix which, of the map, which takes the real vector alpha um, and maps it to uh, and maps it to the um, real vector m here. Uh, I see my video is a little jerky. Um, if my audio breaks up, tell me in the chat, and I'll switch to mobile data. Um, Okay, uh, so what's going on here? Uh, we have a non-singular matrix. Um, so it's non, this, the matrix of this linear map, which goes from alpha to this, this M, now evaluated uh, with the, the form of interest being alpha dot F, so the alpha back in its rightful place up here. Um, uh, so this is linear. Uh, essentially because of this defining property here, because this MF is linear in the coefficients of, of this form F. Um, okay. Um, so it's non-singular precisely because we do not have a bad, a bad tuple. So this, this definition of a bad tuple um, uh, comes in exactly um, because we want this matrix, the matrix, this linear transformation to be non-singular. Um, uh, so if it, if, if, it had, um, uh, if it had a null vector, that null vector would have to be defined over Q because this matrix, if one thinks about it, it, it has integral coefficients. Um, um, okay. And in fact, this matrix has uh, ha has not just uh, uh, integer entries, they're integers up to this size. Um, and that comes again, it sort of comes from this defining property of, of the forms MF. Um, it comes from the fact that they're linear 
in the in the coefficients of the uh, they're linear in the in the coefficients of the form, and they're linear in each of these d minus one vectors. Um, and so from that one finds that the this the matrix of this linear map is has integer coefficients and is of size p to the d minus one theta. Um, okay. Um, and what else do we know? Well, we know that our d minus one tuple uh, is a solution to these Diophantine equations. Um, and the point is that we can we can look at that um, as a linear condition involving this matrix. Um, so we can just write this system of multilinear forms that appears here. Um, we can write it uh, as m times alpha. And then this system of Diophantine inequalities is just that m times alpha should be close to an integer point. Okay. And so now, uh, once one's got to this point, somehow the, 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 the finishing stroke is, uh, is, is somehow easy now. Um, so we have, a, we have a linear problem. Uh, we take a, a, a non-singular uh, square submatrix of this matrix M. Um, so this matrix M is, um, uh, so this is going to be an R by uh, N by R matrix. It's going to be an N by R matrix. Um, since it maps an R vector to an N vector. Um, so uh, if it's non-singular, so it doesn't have any, any, any null vectors, um, we can take a non-singular R by R submatrix of this matrix, and we can invert it to, to, to solve our problem, to solve our linear problem. Um, uh, and okay, one thinks a little about what, what size the, uh, um, one thinks a little about what, 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 the, uh, what the inverse of a, of a non-singular square matrix of integers of a given size looks like. One thinks about how large that matrix might be. Um, and what one concludes uh, is this, um, that alpha is close to M primed inverse times V, um, or, or rather times V primed. Um, so M maps an R vector to an N vector. Um, we take an R by R sub matrix, and then we have to take a, a, a sub vector of V. We take the, uh, um, we take the, uh, uh, here we've taken the same R columns of V, um, or, or sorry, here we've taken the same R rows of V as we took uh, in M primed. Um, okay. Uh, so that, and, and this it turns out is, is, is precisely saying that alpha lies um, on the major arcs. This is in fact where the, where the definition of major arcs that, that is used in Birch's work comes from. Um, I mean, uh, okay, there's actually a, a two different sets of major arcs that appear in Birch's original paper, but the ones that I'm talking about here, this is where they come from. Um, uh, so if one unpacks this, um, the denominator Q here is the determinant of M primed. Um, because M primed inverse is, is it's a matrix of rational numbers, but they all have to have denominator dividing the determinant of M primed. Uh, and so this, this, this vector here, it's M primed inverse times V primed. Um, this turns out to be a rational vector uh, with common denominator, uh, the determinant of M primed. Um, and since, M is a matrix of integers of this size. Um, its determinant uh, works out to be at most this size up here. Um, uh, and that's where, um, so that's where the exact form of this conclusion up here comes from. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, why, why is it possible to improve this? I mean, why isn't this optimal? Um, that's kind of the uh, um, that's the problem that I wanted to uh, that I really wanted to, to to sort of drill down into in these talks, um, 
and I haven't entirely come up with an answer that satisfies me. Um, uh, this is this is the best that I could do. Um, so I, I think um, it's perhaps a bit a bit informal to be a conjecture, um, but but my belief is that the reason this um, uh, the reason that this argument isn't optimal, that the reason that this this these sets of major arcs aren't you know genuinely capturing um, the the set of alpha on which the exponential sum really is this large, um, uh, I think is this. Uh, so in this proof, um, we have this vector v, um, which comes out of uh, the definition of this counting function here. Um, so I think that for most vectors v um, and for, uh, for most vectors v, um, the diff they, so typically there should be multiple uh, different non-singular uh, submatrices we could choose. And even if a given, sub, a given R by R submatrix of M, this N by R matrix, isn't non-singular, it still gives us uh, it still gives us some information about, about alpha. Um, so I think looking at different, uh, different sub-matrices of M ought to give contradictory approximations to alpha uh, for a typical V. Um, so in other words, the, this condition here um, doesn't just give us information about alpha, but it also gives us information about the vector V. Um, and in uh, in this uh, in this argument at the end here, um, uh, this v prime kind of becomes the vector a, or it, it goes into the, the it, it goes into the vector definition of the vector a. Um, so uh, if we could rule out most v's then this would be kind of like ruling out a lot of A's. And that's roughly what, what I think would happen. Um, so in other words, um, uh, in other words, what, what I think should happen, I'm not quite sure exactly how to implement this, this idea in practice. It doesn't seem to be an actual viable proof strategy, uh, but informally and heuristically, what I think is, is, should happen here um, is that this condition should actually restrict the number of possible Vs. Um, and that kind of restricts the possible boxes that can arise here. Either they have to be a bit smaller um, or only certain A's can appear. Um, uh, okay, so I think this is why there's room to reduce the measure here. I mean, uh, one can take all of these regions with V primed running over all the possible integer vectors of the appropriate size m primed running over all the possible integer matrices of the appropriate size and add up the measure of all of these regions and it's the same as the measure of the major arcs. Um, so if we make any, any restrictions on the possible m primes and v primes, um, that, will, that will give us a reduction in the measure of the, of the major arcs. If we can rule out most v primes or rule out most m primes, that will give us a different set of major arcs with smaller measure. Um, so that, that, that's what I, what I think should happen. Um, now, this, this strategy that I've, de I've described where one takes this condition here and tries to, tries to get interpreted as a condition on V primed, um, this doesn't actually seem to be a practical way to improve Birch's result. Um, it, it seems like you end up, if you try to do this, it seems there's a kind of dominant term uh, which comes from those D minus one tuples uh, for which there exists a, a, a non-trivial uh, integer vector a, um, for which uh, this vector is congruent to naught mod uh, the determinant of m primed, um, and uh, well, basically th this determinant is much larger than your variables. So you're trying to uh, count solution to a congruence uh, modulo something which is much bigger than your variables. It's it's not it's it's completely unclear to me how to proceed. Um, so actually implementing this, it, it, it seems hard. But there, there are ways in which one sort of can do this, not, not by a direct attack, not by directly trying to interpret this as a condition on, on the possible V, 
Um, but there, there are ways to, to implement an argument of this form. And actually, I would argue that a lot of the improvements on Birch's theorem in the literature can kind of be seen in this light. Um, so uh, as one example, um, uh, so there's work of, um, of Skinner uh, extending Birch's work to, to systems of forms defined over number fields. Um, and uh, in a sense, you can, you can see, um, uh, so this proceeds by taking integral bases um, to reduce to, um, to a problem over, um, uh, over the integers. Um, and so you, could, you can see this as, uh, you can see forms over number fields, solving, finding zeros of forms over number fields is a kind of special case of finding zeros of forms over, over Q. Um, uh, and what happens is that if, um, and this now is, is very hand wavy, um, but what happens is that if this system F with integer coefficients sort of comes from a system of forms with coefficients in, in some number field, then only some matrices M primed can arise here. Um, uh, so you can rule out most of the possible M primes. Um, and that's one way of seeing where, um, uh, where, where, where the, uh, the fact that Skinner's work is able to do better than Birch's work sort of comes from. Um, and could actually give an alternative proof of Skinner's result uh, uh, by exactly this argument, um, uh, by doing a version of lemma, lemma C, which says, well, if this uh, system of forms F comes from, a it comes from a system of forms over a number field, then we can rule out most possible matrices M primed. Um, okay. Um, and uh, so I was going to discuss um, this, this work of, uh, of, of Dietman and of Schindler, um, which kind of does do uh, the thing I was saying. Um, uh, but I think I'm running a bit short of time. Um, so let's see, perhaps I, I can make some very brief statement about this. Um, Um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to go into this in any in any detail this time, um, but uh, the work of Dietman uh, and Schindler, um, they what they do is they they change the definition of bad d minus one tuples, um, and uh, they change this definition in in such a way um, that for um, that for a, a sort of at least typical systems f. Um, we can, uh, we can get a bit more of a saving. Um, so they change the definition of the bad tuples in such a way that we can still run the same argument, um, but the set of bad tuples gets a bit smaller. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, in this way, they're, they're, able to, um, uh, uh, they're able to realize a slight improvement. Um, okay, uh, so next time we'll talk about um, uh, a sort of, and they, they, they don't directly do the thing that I was hinting at. So they don't directly exclude, exclude most Vs. Um, one can't see in their work that that's, that, 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 that that's where the improvement might be coming from. Um, uh, but in some sense, I think that's why there's room there. Um, uh, so what they do in a, in a sense could be seen as trying to get round the difficulty of actually counting Vs, which, 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 for which this, this condition is possible. Um, and next time I, we're going to talk about a, 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 a different way um, to, to realize an improvement on this lemma C, a, a different way to, to do something um, uh, about this, to do something new with this condition um, on alpha M and V. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Do we have any questions?